All right, and we're live. I hope I'm coming through properly. Sounds working everything. Otherwise, uh, hit me up in the comments, but uh, let's go. Welcome everyone to our second online meetup of the year. Exciting times, crazy times, but also very exciting. So uh, I'll start with a quick introduction and I'll just get right into it. Um, here we go. So we're the Dutch Enter user group. Uh, we're founded in 2011, and we have over 1,200 members uh, on Meetup. We focus purely on Android. It's free, and we do monthly meetups. Furthermore, this is usually the point where I ask everyone to raise their hand if they're new. So if you are, feel free to, again, leave a comment, because uh, uh, that's all we got for now. I can't see you, unfortunately. Hopefully, that'll be uh, back to normal soon. Uh, then I'm one of the organizers. I didn't quite introduce myself yet, but I'm Rob. Uh, but I don't do this alone, obviously. I do this together with Jarcino, Dion, and our newest member, Yolanda. Then uh, if you want any more info about the Dutch Energy User Group, you can uh, check us out on dutchalpha.org. Uh, and you can also join our Slack community, where we discuss all things Android. There's a lot of bright minds there. So if you have any questions, it's a really cool place to uh, discuss and uh, check all that out. So uh, furthermore, uh, the Dutch Energy User Group is a Google developer group, and we're also not alone there. There's a Dutch Energy User Group, but there's also a GDG Cloud. If you're interested in more cloud-related stuff, there's Women Tech Makers. They focus on women tech makers. Uh, and then there's GDG NL. They focus on the whole uh, suite of uh, Google products, also doing a lot of stuff with Flutter. So if you have some interest there, definitely uh, sign up for their meetup page as well. And uh, you can find all this info also on gdgnl.app. Uh, then for tonight, we have some really exciting stuff for you. First off, we'll kick the night off with uh, Stefan Mitev, who will give an introduction uh, on Kotlin Flow with his talk, Going With The Flow. And then when we have all the basics down, it's time to put it all into practice. So that's when we'll get to open the door, getting into the garage with Android coroutines and a bunch of other stuff. This is where we'll combine coupling flow with well all the cool stuff you see here above. And who hopefully so will give a great talk about this. And I think I have a small teaser for you guys. So the, the talk is called Open the Door. And if I add this cam, you can see. Uh, oh, let me put it full screen. Yeah, something cool is going on there. I wonder what that'll end up being. So let's get back here. Uh, yeah, I kind of ruined the agenda already, but we'll start off with uh, going with the flow. Then we'll have a small Q&A. Uh, then there's a 10 minute break, so you can get a drink or something uh, before we uh, dive into the second talk, uh, open the door. And then we have another Q&A. As for questions, uh, you can ask any questions in the live chat. Uh, yeah, we'll monitor them and bring them up uh, in the stream as well. We'll either do that during the Q&A or if it's some really cool question that's really related to that current topic, we'll try to bring it in uh, as we go along. And yeah, that's actually it for my part. So time to get to the really exciting stuff. And I'll uh, invite Stefan uh, here to the stage. That's Stefan. Hey there. <laughs> Hey, how are you, how are you doing? <laughs> awesome, man. Uh, very uh, happy and excited to uh, to present today. Good. We're very excited to have you here as well. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like you're sharing your screen at the moment. Maybe you can oh. check that. Yeah. I think when you showed up. Uh... Yeah, I know. it's showing up now. So uh... wait. Is the wrong screen. There you go. Awesome. Uh, should show up now. Yes. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, if you're ready, I'm just going to cut myself out of the stream and uh, give the word to you. Good luck. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah. Hi, uh, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Stefan, and I work at ING as an Android uh, engineer. And um, I work uh, uh, primarily. I'm involved with uh, the security aspect of uh, our uh, banking app. Uh, primarily involved with encryption, authentication, authorization, um, also monitoring, and this kind of stuff. 
Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Kotlin Flow. And uh, this is the agenda uh, that you're going to see. Um, I will mostly cover uh, everything. I will mostly not cover everything related to uh, everything what Kotlin Flow has to offer. Uh, but the idea is to just get you inspired uh, so you can try it in your next or why not uh, current project. Uh, there will be some comparison between uh, collections, uh, uh, collections, channels, uh, and also, of course, the star of the show, Kotlin, Kotlin Flow. Um, and then uh, we'll see some uh, operators, how to use it, uh, how to use uh, Kotlin Flow in uh, UI, uh, how to wrap uh, callbacks. Uh, and yeah, that's it, basically. So. Uh, the Kotlin Flow is a library for working with uh, asynchronous uh, streams. Uh, it's a library that basically allows us to create, uh, transform, and compose data streams, uh, as well as uh, perform side effects. And all this by chaining operators, uh, which is quite, quite similar to RxJava but using coroutines. Um, the design is uh, quite simple. There are only two uh, interfaces uh, that you have to work with. Uh, one is flow, and the other one is a flow collector. Uh, you have this collect. Uh, it's a terminal operator uh, from which you can uh, emit uh, values. Uh, and we'll see some. Uh, some code examples. I, I wanted to show you how, uh, what is the difference between channels, flow, and uh, collections. So you see uh, where it gets uh, handy to use a uh, flow. Okay. So uh, yeah, these are the three examples we're gonna look at. Um, so we have, uh, say we have uh, this get items uh, and print items, these two functions. Um, in the, in the first case, we build a list, uh, and each of the elements, in this case uh, x, y, z, uh, will fetch them from somewhere. It doesn't matter where. And then uh, we'll iterate through, from, through the collection and print uh, each of them in the terminal. So what happens? We call a get items, and then uh, we jump to the get items uh, function. We fetch x, we fetch y, we fetch z. And then uh, we return uh, the list, which we can iterate through. And then we uh, print uh, x, y, z, uh, as expected. So this is the, kind of the, this is the flow. We generated uh, a list with uh, three items. And then we passed uh, that collection to the for each. Um, we have also channels. Uh, for instance, that's uh, one way to create a channel using the produce uh, builder. Uh, and we have the same, the similar, similar situation, like we have the print items and get items function. Yeah. Uh, but this time we use consume each instead of uh, for each, which will allow us to iterate through the channel and print the, the items. So this is the, the flow. Uh, we call get items. Uh, then we jump to uh, this uh, produce uh, builder, and from there we uh, we fetch uh, x. Uh, could be from uh, internet, could be from uh, database, doesn't matter. And then we emit it or we send it through the channel. Uh, and now we're gonna see the difference. We're gonna jump to consume each, and then we'll print x. Uh, and now the con the flow of control will go back to. Uh, the channel, and then we'll uh, execute uh, fetch X, uh, y, and then uh, send it over the channel. And then we're going to print it, fetch z, send it, and print it. Uh, so you see it's, uh, there is a slight difference. Uh, as soon as we have an element that we can emit, uh, it is emitted, and we can uh, process it, uh, which is very similar to how uh, Kotlin uh, Flow works. Uh, but there is a difference uh, in in sense that as soon as you create uh, these items, get items, 
uh, it starts producing and it doesn't care if uh, there is someone to listen. So channels there uh, known as uh, hot, hot streams and flow is known as cold stream. So uh, if there is no, no one to listen, uh, we still gonna do some work and maybe we don't want that or maybe we will miss some events and also uh, we need to also take care of uh, closing the channels uh, and we have to deal with subscriptions there while with uh, cotton though uh, there is no notion of a subscription uh, so this is how uh, cotton flow uh, looks like this uh, simple builder uh, flow uh, in which you can um, emit your items from. Again, we have print items function that will collect this time. It wouldn't, uh, in the previous two examples, we use a for each and consume each. Uh, in this case, we have collect um, extension function that allow us to collect each item emitted from the flow. And here's the, here's the flow. <laughs> uh, so we call a get items. Uh, then we go back to, uh, we create the flow. Then we fetch an X, we emit it. Uh, then we the control flow goes back to collect, and then we can print uh, the item that we emitted. Then goes back to fetch uh, Y, we emit it, print it, fetch Z, emit it, print it. So as you see, it's very similar to uh, how channels work, um, but there is like there is this back and forth. Uh, meaning uh, the flow wouldn't emit before uh, collector uh, consumes the event and then we'll give back the control to flow so it can emit another one. So it's uh, synchronous, uh, sequential, sorry. Um, and also if we cancel the coroutine that, that's collecting, then the whole stream is canceled while if we uh, cancel uh, a protein that is consuming a channel, the channel will not be disposed. Uh, it, will, it will still emit, will still uh, continue doing some work. So this is kind of the main difference. Um, so this is how we can use it in UI. Um, a flow, flow off, it's a convenience operator, uh, oh, not operator, a constructor to uh, create flow and accepts a collection or uh, var arc. In this case, we have this flow of uh, items. And then we do some kind of transformation using the map operator, which is kind of pretty much the same like uh, with working with collections or Arc Java. It's uh, most of the operators there, uh, they have the same name. Uh, say we have also activity, and from the activity using the lifecycle scope, we're allowed to uh, call launch and create a coroutine from there. Uh, we can uh, get a reference to the items and then collect them. Uh, each, each item will be added to some, in this case, uh, recycler view. Um, but if you want to control uh, the threading, we can add the flow on. Um, operator onto the the, um, the flow, which will uh, change the threading upstream and not downstream. And uh, everything above, of course, will execute in this case in a, in a background thread. And um, the collection is is happening on uh, the, the collector's context. And in this case is uh, dispatcher's main because the life, life cycle scope um, uh, is, is using the dispatcher's main. But if you, is a, if you have a different scope or you de define different dispatcher, collect will be, on, uh, will be using that uh, dispatcher. And to make uh, this uh, code even shorter, uh, because the whole idea of using coroutines is to not uh, go in a lot of indentation. Um, there is a convenience uh, function or operator called the launch uh, in. And this allows us to make this code a little bit shorter. So instead of collect, we, we have 
uh, on each, and then uh, we can write the, our code that we execute it every time there is an mission that we want to collect. And with the launch in, we say, okay, in, uh, execute the collection in this kind of scope. Um, and another thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, wrapping uh, callbacks. Um, this is one of the ways to um, wrap a callback-based uh, API using a coroutine. Uh, the coroutine builder called suspend cancelable coroutine. Um, but it allows us to resume the coroutine only once. So if we have a callback that is going to be called multiple times, we cannot use this because it will crash. It will uh, crash with exception saying, hey, but this coroutine already resumed or it was already completed. Um, so we cannot really use it for um, callbacks that produce multiple uh, events. Um, so we have another uh, builder. It's called uh, call Callback Flow and allows us to um, to emit multiple items. Um, and then whenever we decide, we can close uh, we can close um, yeah, the stream. Uh, we use this uh, await close um, uh, function, which will make uh, the flow suspend until either uncompleted is called or which close the channel um, or there is external cancellation. So if we cancel the coroutine that it's collecting, then we'll uh, await close will be activated and then we can do some uh, cleanup for instance we can uh, unregister in this case uh, this callback so we wouldn't leak uh, any objects in memory and then uh, the flow is uh, is gone uh, mind that um, if uh, if uh, sorry if um, there, there could be overflow if you use, uh, uh, depending on what kind of channel it's being used, uh, it, there, there could be a buffer overflow. And when you consume the callback, uh, when you consume the flow, you can, uh, you can specify a different uh, buffer, for instance, conflated. So it will wait the consumer to consume so that it can produce another value. Uh, or you can say um, uh, some capacity for the buffer which um, will allow you to emit more value, uh, values quicker than uh, the consumer is able to uh, consume. But the safest way uh, would be uh, using a conflated uh, buffer. So uh, there will be uh, a back pressure uh, support. Okay. And okay, operators. There are a lot of operators. Uh, well, not as many as in R Java, but they're already quite a bit. Um, you can see them. Uh, you can find them all of them here. Uh, but basically, you have like map, flat map, uh, filter, combine, zip, all the operators that you already know from R Java. Some of them are slightly. Um, well, they they're uh, renamed. Uh, but they're very easy to uh, to find. Uh, but you should basically you should know there is the flow builder and uh, the collect uh, uh, yeah the collect uh, operator. That's all you need to to start writing operators. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, for instance, this is a, how a filter operator could be implemented. Uh, we create a flow, uh, and then we collect uh, all the emissions from uh, the original flow, and based on the value of the predicate, then we emit the value, uh, and that's it. And there is a shorthand um, uh, construct that basically um, it's called transform, and represents flow and collect in in one uh, in one lambda, so it it hides uh, the boilerplate for you. So if you say transform, then delay emit, uh, and we call this operator delay, 
every mission will be delayed with the period that you specified. So it's really, really simple to create your own operators. Um, unlike RxJava, where you have to uh, know really the internals, how RxJava works. Uh, this is uh, way, way uh, simpler. Um, yeah, this is uh, the sources you can uh, look into and um, that I used for making this presentation. Um, and just to recap, uh, Kotlinflow uh, gives, uh, forgive, sorry. <laughs> uh, it represents a uh, code streams. It's a uh, asynchronous, but at the same time uh, sequential because uh, uh, the suspending um, because of this back and forth that uh, this, that I explained earlier. Um, the, there is back pressure support already because because of the nature of uh, suspending uh, functions, and there is no concept of subscriptions unlike channels. So once you cancel uh, a coroutine that is collecting uh, a stream, uh, flow is canceled as well. It's also declarative. So if you if you call a, a flow, nothing's gonna happen uh, unless you call collect. And with the uh, flow on and launch in, you can uh, you can specify the threading either upstream or downstream. And if you work with Arc Java, you can use um, as a publisher or as flow uh, extension functions to um, to convert uh, one to the other. So you can uh, use it in, in your app. And yeah, with this, uh, the presentation is over. <laughs> If you have any questions, uh, you can uh, shoot. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment box right now. We can highlight them in the stream, and uh, Stefan can take a look at them. Uh, in the meantime, I think I also have a quick question for yeah. you. OK. Uh, I'm pretty comfortable with Rx. Haven't played a ton with Flow yet. Is it time for me to uh, make a switch or start uh, exploring it even more? Or uh... um, I, I, I couldn't think of a case where I would need direct Java right now, to be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. But you don't need to <laughs> just remove it just for the sake of it. Um, you could start um, writing your new code with Cosmic Flow because if you're already using the latest uh, version of uh, coroutines, uh, you have Kotlin Flow. Uh, you don't need to pull another dependency. Yeah. Um, so the new code you can write it with Cosmic Flow and. If you do some refactoring, you can go back and uh, change the Rx Java code. But if you want to consume Rx Java and Confluent at the same time, then you can use uh, those extension functions to convert uh, one stream type of to another. They basically uh, um, implement the reactive streams uh, specification, so uh, they're basically interoperable. Cool. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, I see some questions coming in in the meantime. So let's first uh, give. The okay, I cannot see them, so you have to. Uh... Okay, I'll just uh, read them out loud then. So Hugo Fisser, he's asking, would you replace <laughs> RX code with Flow and coroutines, or are there still things where RX is a better fit? Yeah, that's what I said. Uh, yeah, basically. I, uh, yeah. So for you, sounds like there's no real reason to uh, stick with RX for now. Well, at least not uh, for me. Uh, I couldn't think about the use case where I would I miss in uh, uh, I would miss if I use uh, Kotlin Flow, unless it's some operator. Um, I know there is some gap with the time um, window uh, operators. It's not as extensive as Ari Java, um, so that could be an issue. Uh, but it's relatively simple to write uh, operators. So maybe you could come up with uh, your own. Cool. All right. Sounds good. Uh, next up, how does, uh, by Yolanda Proof, how does it play together with live data? Oh, yes. Uh, awesome question. Uh, there is uh, actually uh, another coroutine um, uh, extension uh, function that allows you to, co to, con to convert to live data as well. 
so uh, it, you say you have a view model it, internally in your domain uh, layer, you always use uh, coroutines and Kotlin flow. And from the view model, you want to expose live data to your uh, UI. Uh, you can totally convert it to live data and uh, make use of it. For instance, if you want to use uh, to use it with data binding, I think it's a good use case. Otherwise, you could use the lifecycle scope uh, from the activity, and you would you don't need uh, live data because the lifecycle scope uh, will follow the the lifecycle of the activity or a fragment. Well, makes sense. Awesome. Uh, all right, even more questions popping up. So uh, from <laughs> is asking, is it well documented? Rx is pretty good documented. Um, there, there is, yeah. Um, I've looked into the source code, and the source code is full with uh, comments. Uh, also, examples in the in the Kotlin uh, docs in the source file. Um, they also have a website where you you can find also uh, explanations. And um, yeah, I, I didn't feel like. They're, they have a lack of uh, the documentation. Sounds good. Uh, next up, uh, Ilya Stana, how could you do polling? Polling, polling. sorry. Yeah, call on the API every X seconds. Ah, OK. Well, you can, with coroutines, you can just uh, do a for loop <laughs> and uh, just delay the, the iteration. But that would mean it would just keep going and going and going if you do like four or while true, basically. Is that your idea? Or uh... if I understood the question correctly, it depends uh, the, on the on the condition uh, until when you want to to do polling. Yeah, I guess. But why would you do polling? <laughs> fair question as well. <laughs> Maybe speaking <laughs> back to that as well. But I guess during the life cycle of your app or something, while it's uh, resumed, you would uh, constantly do polling to fetch the latest data because the backend really doesn't work any other way. <laughs> <laughs> These things happen. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so for loop, uh, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, Giovanni is asking migration from Rx Java to question is a bit fake to me, but I guess how hard it would be to migrate from Rx Java to to something like. Oh, that. okay, yeah. Um, as I said, the operators they're very very similar, um, so you would on in some cases, yeah, you would need to do a bit more refactoring. Uh, the, it depends on the complexity of your. Uh, chaining of operators, to be honest. Um, some operators, they, they were renamed. I think a flat map is uh, flat map concat uh, right now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but it's really uh, intuitive. Uh, if you see the, um, uh, the, the docs, you will uh, get around. Um, the, the other reason why they're different is that in Rx Java, uh, some operators they they are synchronous and they they can do only synchronous work, uh, while other are for asynchronous. For instance, uh, you have a map operator which uh, is when it's called, uh, it will do a, a transformation on the same thread. But say you want to do it another thread because it's very, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, too heavy. Uh, then you have to use another operator. But with coroutines or with your Kotlin flow, sorry, uh, you have only one operator. Um, and you get this uh, kind of for free because you're using a spending function. Um, then you can do whatever you want. Yeah, uh, that sounds really good. <laughs> uh, uh, just to add one more thing, uh, I think that they, they had some lint uh, rules that they, they were uh, giving you a he give you a heads up, hey, uh, this is how you have to do it in the Kotlin flow. And they also uh, created some extension functions that allow you to use the operators just like in Irish Java, but they're deprecated. So they say, OK, uh, just hit uh, uh, option uh, Enter, and they will be replaced with the, the correct uh, operator. 
So that's that's actually how one of the operators that I didn't know how to use. So okay, I'm just gonna write it with Ari Java style, and I will see which one I should be using. Makes sense. That, cool. And ID is kind of helping. Yeah, uh, uh, I have two more questions I'm gonna highlight, and then I think it's time for a quick break. So uh, okay. let's see. We have Martin Edgar. Any idea about the overhead from Flow? Publisher oh. and the other way around. Awesome. Um, I haven't done any be uh, benchmarks, but uh, I did look at um, the presentation they did, I think, in the Kotlin conference, Kotlin Conf, and they did a comparison between uh, using uh, a sequence from uh, the Kotlin library. That's the uh, that. Flow is using a sequence uh, internally. Uh, that's uh, like the most, uh, uh, the building block of Kotlin Flow sequence. And then you have uh, a bit higher level, uh, I guess that, that, will, that will be Kotlin Flow. And they also did comparison with uh, Rx Java and I think Project uh, Reactor. Uh, between uh, both uh, Project Reactor and uh, Kotlin uh, Rx Java, uh, it was pretty much the same uh, kind of performance. Um, I think, oh, sorry, I'll back up. Uh, they did benchmark using the this uh, Scrabble uh, test. Uh, it's a basically application that it's doing all kind of uh, operations and it's really testing your uh, uh, framework. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Using sequences uh, for that test, I think it was about uh, five seconds. Uh, yeah, five seconds. Uh, Arik Java was like uh, 20, 30 seconds. And with uh, Kotlin Flow was uh, in between around uh, 12 seconds. But of course that sounds very vague, <laughs> not knowing what uh, they do. <laughs> but the bottom line it was, yes, it's uh, uh, twice as uh, faster uh, compared to Arik Java <laughs> to, to answer the original question. <laughs> yeah, sounds good, sounds good. But uh, you can find the uh, the video uh, in the source of this presentation. I will share the slides uh, later. Yeah, awesome. I'm gonna do one more. Uh, let's see. I love this profile picture, by the way, yeah, Marta. Really cool stuff. All suited <laughs> up with sunglasses. <laughs> nice. Uh, so one more from uh, Saikaski. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, would you say flow could change significantly as it matures, or is it pretty solid right now? Uh, yeah, it did hit uh, stable, um, so it must be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to call it uh, a day now for this Q&A then, because we have more cool stuff coming up. I would recommend everyone to join the Slack because Stefan is there as well. You can uh, ask any questions uh, there as well. I think uh, he'd be willing to answer some more stuff. Uh, if yeah, of course. Any, uh... Any more questions? Uh, yeah, that's it for now. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. And uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Stefan, and uh, we'll speak soon. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Cheers. All right. Yeah, then we'll have a small break. Uh, I'd recommend uh, growing a drink, uh, hitting the bathroom. We'll be back in about five minutes. Shouldn't take too long, because there's no queue for the bathroom at your own place. So that's really awesome. See you in a bit, guys. <laughs>
All right, and we're back. I hope you all had a good break and grab some drink. I already see some jokes flowing by uh, by Dion. Are oh, the drinks slowing? Well, cheers. They sure are over here. So uh, enjoying myself. Hope you guys are as well. So next up is, well, I don't know if you remember this picture. Still kind of curious what's going to happen there. So uh, let's uh, bring in our uh, second speaker. Hey, Hugo, how are you doing? Hello. How are you guys? Awesome to have you here. I'm going to share your slides as well. And uh, yeah, if you're ready, I'm just going to hand over the word to you. OK, cool. OK, so uh, hello, everybody. Uh, nice that you're here. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Hugo. Oh, I'm just going to turn off this noise cancellation. It's killing me. Yeah, that's better. Uh, I'm Hugo. I, uh, I'm an Android developer for many years and also a Google developer expert for Android. And today, I'm going to talk about my garage door and how I automated it. Um, let's see if I can move the slides. Yes. Um, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, I promised a lot in my abstract. Uh, I promise you to show all the things. I'm going to show you almost all the things. Um, I'm skipping the end hardware part because otherwise we would be here all evening. Um, if you want to follow along, uh, the slides are up. And uh, yeah, if something's unclear or you need more details, feel free to ask more questions in the chat. I'll try to get to them uh, during the presentation or otherwise after. Yeah, so let's get started. This is my uh, old garage door on the left. And uh, yeah, it's a fine door, but uh, yeah, it's a manual door. And uh, as some of you know, I ride a motorcycle and it's kind of annoying to have to open this thing by hand. Um, especially when you're arriving in the rain, then you have to take off your gloves, step off the motorbike, open the garage door. Uh, it's a lot of hassle. It's also a lot of first world problems, of course. It's also a tilting door. So um, uh, what used to happen once in a while is that uh, there's, you can't see it on the picture, but there's like a, a recycling container uh, in front of that door sometimes if my neighbor is pushing it too much on my side and then it will block the door. So all well, super annoying. And so I decided to uh, get an electric door that opens in place like a sectional door, that's called. Uh, but actually the real reason was I needed another project. And um, yeah, so that's what we did. So um, my goals for the project was actually to co control opening the garage door with an app instead of a remote. Because uh, yeah, I simply don't want to carry that remote with me all the time. Um, I have my phone always on me, so that seems obvious. And this is what I would call level one, like uh, easy challenge. Maybe not so easy, I don't know. Uh, level two would be uh, opening the door for my motorcycle and then especially if possible, without reaching for my phone. Because like I mentioned, uh, when you're on the, on the motorbike, you're wearing gloves. Um, reaching for the phone uh, with gloves on is, is almost impossible. And you can't even control it with the, with the gloves on, of course. Uh, and even the remote, um, controlling the remote from your, with gloves on is not something that is very uh, uh, feasible. So uh, yeah, that was my level two uh, action. And then as a bonus, I uh, could open, uh, would want to open my uh, garage door from the Wear OS watch. It's like a little extra that I implemented uh, when we started to be in lockdown. Um, and uh, yeah, one of the other goals was that it needs to be secure, right? I uh, don't really have the uh, necessity to open my garage door for anywhere in the world. And I certainly don't want others to open my garage door from anywhere in the world. So um, uh, <laughs> picture of the bike will come when I show the demo. Uh, anyways, uh, so yeah, it needs to be on the local network on only. Uh, and it also needs to be a little bit secure, even if it's on the local network only. I decided to uh, implement some additional security so that you just, yeah, if you can get to my network, you still can't open the door without a one-time passcode. And that's the same kind of passcodes that uh, you would use for two-factor authentication on Google, for example. So it's an open protocol. You have libraries for that to do that. Uh, so I could uh, generate those codes from a Google Authenticator app, but um, I'm using uh, generating those codes from my phone, basically. Uh, let's look at the hardware of the thing. So um, garage, garage door opens with a garage motor. Uh, the motor is controlled by radio frequencies. So it's using this, uh, yeah, so this remote. Um, you can't just go, um, 
basically record whatever signal is being sent and then replay that. That would be very bad because anybody could do that. Uh, it's actually protected by a rolling code scheme. So that means that um, every time you press the button, a, a different variation of the code is being sent to the to the unit and that they have some kind of secret pairing uh, algorithm that uh, makes sure that this uh, connection is uh, secure. Uh, what it does have is uh, a physical connection where you can attach uh, a switch. And that's a super simple circuit where you can basically uh, short two wires and that sends a pulse to uh, open the door or close it or stop it when it's moving. And this is what I decided to use. There are some other options as well, but yeah, they were either too expensive or not really what I wanted. So what did I do to automate that impulse switch? I used um, a very popular um, uh, IoT kind of device, uh, ESP8266 microcontroller. And um, what's nice about this chip is that it also includes Wi-Fi. So uh, you can have uh, network connectivity and you can have something that runs some code. So if you're not familiar with, familiar with a microcontroller, a microcontroller is basically uh, a chip that runs some dedicated piece of code. And usually it's a simple task because uh, these devices are fairly lim limited. And when I say limited, it, it does have like four max of memory on it, so it's not super limited at, at all. Um, and what you see on the left is a development board, which holds a chip and some other connections to, um, for example, to program it. And also it has some breakout points so that you connect some sensor on it. And this is the, the thing in real size, if you can see this. Yeah, I have another one, slightly bigger. Oh. oh yeah, these these things are pretty cheap. I had some laying around as well, so that you can buy them for about five bucks, and if you get them from China, even cheaper. So I had that to come as the brains of the operation, basically. And then on the right side, you see that same board with on top a little board plugged in, and that's a relay um, shield. So this particular board, you can have shields. And a relay is nothing but uh, uh, an electrical switch, basically. So you feed it some current, and then it switches. And that allows me to short that uh, impulse connection. And in the middle, you see another sensor, and that's an optical distance sensor. And I use that sensor to uh, get a notion of uh, whether this door is open or closed. So um, this is a contraption that I made. So this is uh, stuck on the on the ceiling of my garage door. You see two wires coming out. The blue wire, uh, one is the USB uh, power cable, and the other one is uh, the the connection going to the impulse switch. And then. On the left, you see my garage door. And as that door moves under the, the sensors, the distance measured by that sensor uh, goes from about two meters, the height of my ceiling, to about 20 centimeters. So that 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 I can detect in the Arduino code, in the, in the, in the code for that microcontroller. And then I know it's open or closed. There's always a little bit of a dead point in this case. So now it would say it's still closed, but actually a little bit open. But yeah, for my use cases, this is good enough. I just want to make sure that um, when I want to close it, it, it won't send an additional signal with that because that would make the door stop uh, in, in its track. So yeah. Um, yeah, so how do you program those microcontrollers? Um, the ESP8266, you can program them in a couple of uh, languages. So you can use their proprietary C or proprietary, maybe it's open source, I don't know. Um, C code, you can use uh, micro Python, you can use uh, various things, but uh, probably the most popular framework for this is Arduino. And uh, also these chips run Arduino code. And this is to give you an impression on how that looks. Arduino is basically C or C++ code, but it's so, sort of simplified. So uh, what you can do, you can uh, use digital write to uh, power uh, some pin number and D1 is a pin on this board. Uh, so you can set it to high and that will make that relay uh, close. And then half a second later, you can set it to low and that will uh, cut the current and then uh, the relay opens again. So this is all I need to basically send a little pulse to, to that garage motor to, uh, to make it uh, open or close. Um, so this is my basic setup. I have my phone. It's communicating over Wi-Fi with that uh, Arduino, and then the Arduino is uh, in in its, in its turn is um, talking to the garage motor. Uh, I actually wanted to have this uh, bidirectional because um, 
I can still open the door with a remote, for example, and it would be nice to just tell me as the door state uh, changes to, uh, yeah, it would be nice to see that in the app immediately. So what I use for that is a WebSocket. And uh, yeah, you, as you might know, Android and uh, has a pretty uh, good uh, support for that with OKTHP. And on the Arduino side, there's also a library for that. The only um, the only thing here is that you can't use secure WebSockets because the, the, the ESP8266 is simply not powerful enough to support that. And then we need to talk some kind of protocol over this. And for this, I'm using protocol buffers. Um, <clears throat> protocol buffers has the benefit that it's really small. It serializes to small, uh, a small format, which is beneficial if you're using uh, microcontrollers um, because, uh, yeah, uh, you don't have a lot of memory to parse it, and you can use JSON, but it's kind of a hassle. Um, oh, yeah, I see a question from Peter. How expensive or cheap is that microcontroller? So the microcontroller is around, I think it's like five euros if you buy it in the Netherlands, and that shield is probably less than that. I don't have the exact numbers, but it's around that ballpark. So I think in total parts, maybe... 10 euros, something like that, max. You need some cabling maybe, and you need a little bit in little box to put it in. So it's uh, very cheap to uh, get this started. So uh, yeah, let's continue on uh, the protocol buffers. So uh, like I said, it's a compact representation. So it's uh, ideal for uh, IoT projects like this. And this uh, is kind of the generic way how it would approach this. So whether it's a garage door or something else, you can use this setup for multiple things. Um, Protocol buffers are also uh, backward and forward compatible, which is not super important, important in my case because yeah, I just have one client and I control all the software, so it doesn't really matter. But what's nice about this is that it's cross-platform and that um, the code for those platforms are generated from the protocol buffer schema. So on the Arduino side, you have uh, uh, a library called uh, NanoPB. It's actually C code, just it's not uh, particular to Arduino. And then uh, on the Android side, you just have the normal protocol buffer libraries from Google. And this is how you would uh, define uh, a protocol buffer message. So uh, this is uh, one of the messages I use. And uh, uh, so you can see it has uh, an embedded enum in this case. Uh, all the fields have a number and that, that makes sure that uh, the protocol is stable. So if you, as long as you keep the numbers um, there, so if you, if you don't start renaming open, close, and toggle with different field numbers, then uh, any client can still parse this. Uh, so I have three commands. I can open it, can close it, and I can toggle it. And toggle is basically the same what the remote does. Um, and uh, open and close speak for themselves, I hope. And then in the same message, there's this one-time password code. So the number that you would otherwise type in on, on Google for your two-factor authentication. And it has a duration, and that's used for when opening the door, then uh, after some time, I can also automatically close it, which is kind of nice. Um, yeah. So using that protocol buffer code, um, it generates some code. So um, in, on the Android side, it generates a, a class containing all of your messages. So in my case, that class is called Sesame Protos. Uh, for obvious reasons, my project is called Sesame. Um, and then you have your door command, you give you a builder. Uh, and in that builder, you just set the field set that are already there, right? And it's all generated code. And then eventually you uh, convert that message to a byte array and you send it off over a socket or you can save it to disk or you can do whatever with the protocol buffer. It's very versatile. And this is uh, how you do it on the Arduino side. You have your generated door command message there. Um, you try to decode it. Uh, if that de uh, decoding um, works, then, well, you just continue with that message. Um, and then, um, yeah, you have your commands and you parse that command. You do whatever you want to do with that command. So this is the general approach on the hardware side. Um, so now we have our uh, hardware set up, our a little bit of uh, glue for our uh, garage motor. We have it on the network. We have some protocol, we can speak to it. Now we only have to find it on the network. So how do we find it? Um, yeah, that's, you need some kind of discovery. And a common way to do this is that to do this with, uh, with multicast, multicast DNS. And that's a protocol to um, publish services on your network, much like DNS. 
Uh, it has good support in Arduino as well. There's an MDNS clause where you can say just publish the surface. And in Android, you have the NSD manager. And NSD manager is nice, but it's kind of a hassle because it's a two-step process. You have to first discover a device, and then you actually have to resolve uh, the service. And resolving uh, is what you need to get the IP and port number for the service. So that um, tends to turn into sort of a little bit of a callback hell, and we can make that much nicer when you wrap it in a suspense function. So how do I do that? Um, the suspense function just uh, returns a discovery result in my case, and that's either success or failure. Uh, failure can only happen when yeah, uh, the whole discovery can be started, which can happen in some cases because that might be throttled by the OS. And then we use the suspend cancelable coroutine builder that uh, Stefan also showed uh, a little bit, where you get this continuation, and the continuation is basically your token to set the result on it. And then you set up your listener. In the listener, um, once we have a surface found, we start resolving it, and we pass on the continuation to the next listener because this whole suspense function isn't finished until, um, yeah, until we have the surface resolved, right? And then the important part here is uh, also that this continuation might be canceled because uh, if you cancel the coroutine, then um, yeah, this uh, this whole uh, function is canceled. So you need to clean up uh, any uh, ongoing discoveries. So that's what you do with the on vocal cancellation uh, block here. And then finally, you start the discovery by uh, specifying the service name and specifying the listener. And then back in that resolve listener, there's this continuation again. And that's pretty straightforward. If you find a service, then you just call continuation resume and set the service uh, port and host. And with all that work, what it gives us is a nice one-liner where we can find the, the, the device on the on the on the network. And uh, in this case, I'm assuming I only have one because I only have one garage. Uh, if I move up to a mansion, then I have to figure something else out. Uh, what's also nice about this is that you can now wrap this with uh, coroutine structures like uh, with timeout. So you can, both, for example, set a, uh, a timeout on how long it might take to find that device. All right. So using flow. Um, using flow uh, is kind of uh, nice. I, I use a, a particular pattern in a couple of ways in, in, uh, in the app. So you can think of a connection as a flow of events and states. And I'm modeling this um, uh, in the same way. So you can say, well, this connection starts out disconnected, and then it uh, gets connected. And at some time, at some point, messages start flowing, and at some point, it gets disconnected again. Um, so yeah, we can easily um, model that with a sealed class. Um, so if it's connected, we, we also supply the WebSocket. If it's a message, we get the WebSocket for convenience and also the message. And if it's disconnect disconnected, that's just a, a simple uh, object, right? And then we can start building that connection flow um, like this. We have our OK HTTP client for the uh, for the WebSocket, and it will also ping that WebSocket. So if something happens uh, and the dis the, uh, it gets disconnected or something, then that will yield an error if the ping fails. Um, and then we set up that connection uh, using a callback flow like Stefan also mentioned. So in callback flow, all you do is you set up your uh, new uh, socket. I set up a WebSocket listener. Uh, in that WebSocket listener, I pass in the producer scope. That's kind of convenient. Um, and then like uh, Stefan also mentioned, uh, a wait close is very important. You need to have this here or else your, uh, your flow will just end uh, without doing anything. And uh, usually, you also need to clean up some stuff. So in this case, I'm closing the socket if the, the, the collection of this flow gets canceled. And then in the listener itself for the WebSocket, uh, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. If it's open, we uh, just pass the event by offering it to, um, to the scope. And same for a message. And I'm going to turn off the light for a sec. And we're back. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, how you do that, uh, the, how I do this uh, connection flow. And then consuming that is uh, very nice because now you can just launch a coroutine, create the connection, and collect all the events. 
And then for every event that comes in, you uh, say, well, it's connected. Let's uh, light up the UI. Uh, if it's disconnected, then uh, uh, disable some buttons. And if a message comes in, then handle that. Um, great connection does a little bit more than that um, because it only makes sense to uh, start discovery when we're on Wi-Fi. And especially when you're porting this code to um, to Wear OS, what, which I was doing, uh, ensuring Wi-Fi connect connectivity on Wear OS will also make sure that the uh, watch is connecting to Wi-Fi because usually it's not connected to Wi-Fi for battery reasons. So then um, after we are connected to Wi-Fi, then we start the discovery with the, with the device uh, discovery uh, class that I showed before. And then we want to establish that connection and if I call that connect function, function, it might throw an error if something happens on the network. So we also want to retry any errors that happen. So again, uh, ensuring Wi-Fi connectivity is done with the connectivity manager. And this is, again, a callback flow. Uh, and the, the pattern is the same. You set up your callback. Uh, you um, in, the call, in, the, in the callback, you offer the network that's available. Uh, you set up the request, and uh, again, you have your await close uh, block to clean up if the if the flow gets cancelled. Right, so this is uh, pretty straightforward. And with this with this uh, Wi-Fi network, we can then say, well, if we have the network, we just flat map latest, which means just um, on this latest value, we start something else. Uh, I don't really use the the result from the Wi-Fi network. But you can see that now in this block, I can use my um, my code that I had before for uh, locating the device just as normal code. It's, uh, it's not necessarily a flow. It's, it becomes a flow because I wrap it in this flow builder. And then um, somewhat related to that polling uh, question, I just have a while loop that tries, tries to find a device. And so it spin locks until it has a success. If it has a success, then it emits it and breaks the loop. And otherwise, it will wait five seconds and try again. Well, now this, this uh, discovery could have been a flow as well, but yeah, just just to, to demonstrate how easy it is to incorporate a, any imperative code uh, that you might have uh, already within a flow. Uh, finally, this code also maps it to uh, to uh, to a string. So continuing that function. Um, now we have the host name of my device, and all we have to do is then create a device connection. So that returns our flow of uh, WebSocket events. Um, if something goes haywire there, then um, I'll catch that, that error with a retry win. Um, and then I'll just emit an, uh, an artificial disconnected event just in case it was connected. And then uh, if that happens, I delay and then uh, return true to retry that whole uh, operation. And finally, there's a distinct until change to make sure that if we're in this loop where we try to connect and every, every time it fails for some reason, then you'll get only one time, uh, one disconnected event. So this is that's just for, yeah, for, more, for cleaner uh, messaging, I guess. And with that, we have all the ingredients to build a very ugly app, very bare bones. Um, might be nice to actually show you that app now. So if Rob can share my uh, garage door cam as well. Yes, let's do some live action. Oh, it also makes noise. Okay, cool. So um, are we seeing my seeing my device? And this is my slide, wait. I have to get the right thing. Location window. Yes. Can you share that? Okay. Yeah. So this is my very, uh, very specialized app. <laughs> it literally only shows the shows the status, and I have some extra settings to set some stuff. Uh, yeah. So when I press this toggle button, oh my god, it starts opening, and. I have the remote here as well. So if I stop this in its tracks, it stops. And you can see that now the status changes to open. And if I toggle this again with the remote, it starts closing again. It, the sensor detects that. And then, uh, yeah, it will update the status. 
So this is kind of nice because it's a WebSocket to just get all this live action. So this is the uh, the level one live demo. Um, let's get back to my slides. Uh, where is it? Yes. So carry on. So this was level one. Um, on to level two, opening from the motorcycle. So my initial thought was, well, I've got this sorted. This is easy. I have a, a Bluetooth headset that I always have on my helmet, so I can't. Uh, I can uh, state uh, with great confidence that if that Bluetooth headset is connected, then I'm on the motorcycle. So my first idea was. I have this headset connected that will trigger some broadcast. And then I can set up a geofence. Um, and I think I picked something like three kilometers from my house. And once that geofence is activated, I'm just start uh, uh, start uh, start at the connection. It will start discovery. And, and as soon as it's uh, connected, then I know this. And then I can disconnect the headset, another broadcast, and that can send a signal to open the door. So. That was kind of my initial thought. And actually, the geofencing stuff worked pretty great. Um, I had like a text-to-speech in my helmet to tell me when it hit that geofence, and that was working fine. But then I was in front of my garage door, and nothing happened, because um, while my phone is in my pocket with the screen off, it doesn't really connect to Wi-Fi at all. Uh, even when you request that connection now, on a phone, at least my phone, it seems that it doesn't uh, do anything. Uh, I could have tried to work around this a little bit. Um, a few folks suggested to uh, just call the scanning API for Wi-Fi, but that stuff is being uh, throttled a lot by the OS and probably more in the future. And I don't really know when I should call that because I don't know when I'm actually arriving at, uh, at my house. So that's kind of uh, inconvenient. And uh, yeah, because I was working with electronics anyways, it looks like a new project. Yes, more projects. Um, so opening from the motorcycle. So what do you do if you have a problem with a microcontroller? You put more microcontrollers in your project. Um, so what I did is I added another type of microcontroller, uh, this time an ESP32 based microcontroller with a little power converter. And I built that into my motorcycle. And uh, what's nice about this ESP32 is it's a little bit faster. Um, so yeah, I don't really need that. But it also has Bluetooth Low Energy connectivity, and it has Wi-Fi. So the idea is now that I connect my phone over Bluetooth Low Energy to um, to that uh, microcontroller, and then have the microcontroller do all the connection to the garage door, uh, so connecting the, to the Wi-Fi and also setting up the WebSocket. This way, the phone doesn't have to be connected to, um, uh, to my Wi-Fi, and it, it won't connect because it's on standby, basically. Uh, but it can act as a little bit of a proxy for my um, for my uh, for my phone. So uh, this is what it looks like now. I turn on my headset that starts a foreground surface. That foreground surface starts to connect uh, to the motorcycle microcontroller, uh, more or less using the same connection flow pattern that I had before. Then as soon as that uh, microcontroller is connected to my Wi-Fi and has the, the web, web socket up, it will send um, a notification over an, uh, a characteristic. Like if you if you uh, were with the, uh, at the last meetup, then Frank uh, told you all about this. Um, so it, sent a, it will send a message to my phone that it's connected. And then my phone can write back over Bluetooth to that uh, microcontroller and that will then pass that message on to uh, to the garage uh, using a WebSocket. And what's also nice about it is that this is only powered when the ignition key is turned on. So it gives me another signal that I'm actually on the motorcycle. For that connection, I'm also using protocol buffers. So again, I have this nice schema where I can define what is being sent. Uh, so it's sending whether it's connected or not. It's also sending how, how long it's, uh, the, that microcontroller has been running. Um, which can be useful for understanding if I, for example, are arriving home or leaving home. So if I'm leaving home, that will probably be a short uptime. If I'm arriving home uh, and it gets connected, then the uptime of that microcontroller should be a little bit longer uh, before I get connected. 
And uh, I have a similar measure for uh, the time that I've been connected to the Wi-Fi. I'm not using all of it, but yeah, it's like if you if you're over engineering anyway, then why not over engineering the protocol a little bit as well? So uh, listening for that connection, I have my Bluetooth wrapper uh, called it Eiffel. Yeah, I'm bad with naming. If you know the song, then you then you probably know why it's called Eiffel. Um, so it connects. Uh, it's also a flow, and as soon as it connects, and every time it connects, then um, it will emit a client, an instance of Eiffel, and with that client, I can then check uh, and wait until it's connected. And as soon as uh, as it is connected, that when connected, a uh, block will uh, emit the status, and in that status, I can check if it's uh, up for less than 60 seconds, uh, because, yeah, I thought it would be nice to have some threshold here, uh, just in case it's opening the door all the time. That's not what I want. And then uh, using the text-to-speech API in Android, it will announce in my help helmet that's about to open that door. And then it will send that open command over Bluetooth uh, to the microcontroller. And then the, the microcontroller will send that over the WebSocket. It will get a response over the WebSocket and will send that back over Bluetooth to the phone. And then, uh, yeah, hopefully the door opens. That's, that's, uh, that's the whole deal here. Uh, so I hope that made some sense. I maybe was going a little bit fast. Uh, yeah, I'm a motorcycle rider, so yeah, going fast. Uh, bad jokes. Okay, um, security. I want to touch a little bit on upon the security still. Um, uh, it's important to understand that there is still no uh, secret key for generating the, the one-time password codes on the microcontroller. Uh, if I would store those on the microcontroller, it would be very easy to get into my house by just uh, uh, yeah, just uh, starting my motorcycle or whatever if it's on the driveway, and that's not something that I want. If it gets stolen, I don't want people to also have the key to my garage door. So the secret is only stored on uh, the garage microcontroller and on my phone. And to store it securely on my phone, I'm using another API uh, from the Android X security jetpack library. And that's actually pretty nice because now uh, that provides uh, an encrypted shared preferences. And uh, this code might look a little bit daunting, but for all these uh, constants that you see, there's only one, uh, one option, basically. So this is how you would create encrypted shared preferences. And that means that if I'm, I'm storing my, um, my shared uh, key or the key for generating the, the, the one-time password codes in shared preferences, and now it gets, also gets encrypted in shared preferences. So if by some... For some reason, someone gets a hold of my phone or gets a hold of the file from a backup of somewhere else, then they still wouldn't have the key uh, that they would need to um, send an open command to my garage door. So it might sound a little bit paranoid, but I think for good measure, um, better safe than sorry. Um, I think that's about all I had. I would like to run down to the garage to show you how it opens from the motorcycle. And maybe in the meanwhile, if you have any questions, fill them up in the chat, and then I'll try to answer them as soon as I get back to my desk. So let's go down. Hey everybody, welcome to my garage. So if somebody wanted to see my motorcycle, here it is. Hope you like it. So let's start at the motorcycle end. I mentioned the microcontroller. This, can you see this? So this little thing, I wrapped it in some um, protective stuff, but you might be able to see the USB port on there. This is the microcontroller. Um, maybe you can turn off this light. No, it's not possible. Here is the little Arduino box. Over there is my uh, my garage thing. And for demo purposes, I will turn off turn on my motorcycle ignition first. Yeah. That's powered off, powered on. And what happens now? 
is that, um, uh, oh, how do we get back to this? So what happens now is that the microcontroller is, is already connecting or connected, hopefully, to uh, to this thing. And if I turn on my helmet now, it will start at foreground surface. Oh. And there it goes. Woo! Clap, clap, clap. Hi, neighbors. So, and the message that it sends also has a duration. So if we'll wait for a little bit. It's closing again. And I can do this either way. I can also first turn on my, uh, first turn, turn on the helmet and then turn on, uh, turn on the motorcycle. But uh, because it's then trying to connect to, um, to the Bluetooth module, it might uh, take a little bit longer. So for demo effect, this is much nicer. Um, okay, so let's turn this off again. And now I run upstairs to answer any questions you might have. I hope that worked. <laughs> yeah, that was really awesome. Uh, great demo, great talk. Cool. Really cool stuff. Uh, let's see if some questions start to flow in then. I see a lot of people are actually really excited and think they need to buy a, they need they want to buy a garage door now. I'm kind of one of them. I do have a motor, but I don't have a garage, so no luck for me yet. <laughs> That's the most expensive part of this project. Yeah, we figured in the chat, like, microcontroller, <laughs> $5 garage door, probably, like, uh, way more. <laughs> yeah, that's also why I didn't want to spend any additional hardware uh, stuff from the vendor. Fair enough. Totally worth it, though. <laughs> uh, no real questions yet. Um, yeah, I'm going to give it a couple more minutes because it takes a... Uh, it's like a minute delay before it's posted on YouTube and before I see it on stream. Uh, da, 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 da. So one thing what's nice to point out is that um, you can basically automate anything using this uh, method, right? So um, you know, if you have these ESP chips, then it connects to Wi-Fi, you can do it whatever network you want. And it can also talk to other stuff on your network. So um, yeah, it's really nice to get started with. It's super simple to do, actually. You, you need a little bit of soldering skills sometimes if you want to hook up other stuff. But yeah, for a couple of bucks, and yeah, you're off to mm -hmm. the race. Sounds good. I always think these micro controls are a bit daunting, so I never really played with them myself. I just have the lazy old uh, P of U lights to automate some stuff and uh, like a homey bridge to do some basic home automation. But yeah, this might uh, get me into that a little bit more. I do see some uh, questions, or at least one question come up. Yolanda saying, first of all, it was really clear. And then she's curious what your next project is. <laughs> I don't know yet. Uh, no, I don't have any next projects planned. Uh, I do have some home automation also based on these things. And that's uh, sometimes a little bit flaky. So I might, uh, might want to figure that out first. Cool, because this has been super stable for you uh, so far. Yeah, this has been super, super stable. Rival. And also, uh, initially, what I said, I wanted to have a trigger to open the door. So I was thinking, like, turn off my helmet. And then um, as I do that, then it opens the door. And I actually implemented that. But it turns out that there's quite a bit of delay uh, before Android has this, connect, uh, this broadcast that it has disconnected. Mm. And uh, then I took that out. And it turns out that uh, just driving up to my garage door, it takes a couple of seconds before uh, the connection is being set up, and that's that's good enough. So it's it works pretty great as is. At first, I was a little bit afraid that I would drive into the street, and then my Wi-Fi network would be reaching too far or something like that, and then my door would open, and then everybody could walk in. <laughs> but uh, that's uh, fortunately not the case. You have really sketchy neighbors to be worrying about that, or. <laughs> 
No, it's one thing to consider that these these garage doors also have a protection, right? So if you're if that thing is closing and you block it, it will open again. So yeah. even though it's all automatic, I'll always wait until it's fully closed, because otherwise, uh, yeah, someone could, yeah, come in and then open the door again. Oh, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We have another question uh, by Niels. How long did it did this take? How long did this take you to make? Yeah. yeah so, um, so like I mentioned, I did some similar things before, like with the web socket and with the discovery. So I, I sort of know how to do that. And but the code on the microcontroller is, by definition, it's usually pretty simple because uh, it has a simple task. And in this case, it's basically read that sensor. Um, handle the commands and yeah, do that in a loop. That's basically what's happening. So there's a little bit of a uh, little bit of logic in uh, figuring out. Like, I mean, when when um, when that sensor hits, say it's open or closed, there's a little bit of delay there because I know I'm going to open it, so I, I'll fake that status that's already opening, for example. So there's a little bit additional logic like that that you might want to tweak. But the code itself is not super complicated. It's pretty straightforward. Um, the the part in my motorcycle was a little bit scary because I, for the first time, I had to actually <laughs> modify my motorbike a little bit. <laughs> but um, also that code is fairly simple if you know what you are after. The the even the Bluetooth stuff is not that complicated on the ESP. It has a pretty nice API. So. Um, yeah, I think all in all, it took me um, maybe a weekend for the garage door uh, stuff, and then uh, maybe in a couple of hours uh, for the for the for the motorcycle as well. Because yeah, you can test all this just on your desk. You can have a relay, and you can hear a click, and then yeah, and then all you need to do is write an app and do some other stuff. Cool. Yeah, you mentioned the opening and closing status. You get that when you trigger it from your phone, but do you also get that when you trigger it from uh, the remote? Or is there yes. no way to make the distinction? Um, so, yeah, so the, the garage or unit knows where, where there's open or closed, but it doesn't expose it unless you buy an extension board. Uh, but that sensor is basically sensing all the time if it's open or closed. So even if I open it with the remote, it will... Uh, send a signal over the WebSocket as soon as that status change, it will say, oh, it's now open. And that's that's what the first demo um, also showed. As I'm closing it with my with my remote, uh, the status in the app also updates. So and you uh, even get the opening and closing then, like the intermediary state or? Yeah, well, that's basically, you have to compute that. So you have to know that. Uh, uh, I, I don't. You don't get the intermediate state. You only know it until it's uh, passing the sensor. So now I know that once once it's seeing the floor again, basically. So when, once that distance uh, distance uh, changes to from a couple of centimeters to much larger, then I know it takes a couple of seconds for it's really closing uh, closed. So then I change the status to closing, and then I have to set delay to uh, change it to close. So there's a little oh, bit. Cool. There's a little bit of logic to um, basically stabilize that status a, bit, a little bit, but that's you don't really need it. It's more like <laughs> like an additional icing on the cake. Yeah, fair enough. So really cool to see though. Uh, let's see, Ivano is wondering, uh, or he's assuming you initially started with Brillo solution for Blue's Low Energy, and if that's the case, what was the main roadblock that caused you to switch? To the ESP A266. Um, well, I didn't start a, start with anything else. I could have started. I mean, you could use something like uh, a Raspberry Pi or another things or whatever. But I, it's probably a little bit overkill for this. Um, uses a little bit more power, and yeah, you have to run Linux, and it's all a little bit more complicated. So I think a microcontroller in this case was just fit for the task. I uh, could have used like a more powerful one so that I could use um, uh, secure sockets. But again, I had these uh, these things laying around from my previous thing. I ordered a bunch of them because if you, especially if you get them from China, some some once, once in a while might be uh, broken or might just break down. Um, these are generally not like 
they have a brand, but it's not the brand that they say it is. So, uh, <laughs> so they're all clone clone boards, even if you get them in the Netherlands. Uh, so yeah, Android things for this is not really. You could do this. You can control a relay with Android things, but it's not really. It would be a little bit overkill, I think. So yeah, this is a very simple task, and a microcontroller is super suitable for that. So I started out with these things because I, I had them laying around, and uh, yeah, that was the main reason. Fair enough. Uh, let's uh, head to the last question then. Let's see. Uh, Jonas is wondering, did you do any debug logging while developing the project? Any specific tools for that? Yeah, so that's a little bit, uh, that's basically a lot of print line. Um, on the on the microcontroller, there's not a lot of debugging. I think if you, on the ESP, you might be able to do some little bit more advanced debugging. Uh, I usually don't really need it, but you can hook up hook it up to your USB port. It just gives you a serial console, so you can print, print out statements, and sometimes you can blink lights if that helps. Um, so that's basically the debugging process. But fortunately, that code is pretty simple. So uh, and it's Arduino code, right? So it's pretty simple to, to understand as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think most of the debugging was on the motorcycle side. I wanted to have that connection as fast as possible. So I did some tweaking like a static IP and some other yeah, small things. But yeah, that's most of the debugging. All right, clear. I think that's uh, about it uh, for now. Cool. With that, I want to thank you again for uh, giving this talk. Cool stuff. And uh, yeah, that about rounds up our uh, online meetup for this month. We hope to see you all again soon and uh, hopefully in person soon as well. But uh, otherwise, we'll just uh, continue to, this trend if you guys like it. So please uh, let us know. And uh, with that, everyone, have a good night. Bye. Bye.